Welcome into another edition of Ask the Experts. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Callender. I'm back with us on the show today. Canada's number one real estate agent and noted author, Faisal Suziwala, is back with us once again from Remax Twin City. Hi, Faisal. How are you doing? Fine, thanks, David. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, glad the summer is here. Uh, glad that more and more people are, are getting vaccinated. We were talking off air that we've both had uh, our double shot, so we're set to go. I, I'm, I'm glad to see that kind of progress going on. I'm sure you are too. Yes, absolutely. I think, uh, you know what, Let if 80% of us do uh, what we need to do, uh, and even if the other 20% don't, I think uh, we're going to be okay. And uh, I'm glad that most people have taken on the opinion that they're going to do their part. So it's exciting times. Uh, it's certainly looking forward to this summer and things opening up. If you'd like to get in touch with Faisal, here's how you do it. You can call him at 519-624-5555. Or for more information online, go to homeshack.com. And you can uh, pull up the website as you're listening to the show today. So let's uh, let's get things underway and talk about what we're seeing in the market right now, especially with the easing of the lockdown. We've had a strong, strong spring market leading right up to right now. And what we're seeing since the easing of the lockdown is that people just want to get out. They want to enjoy the patios. They want to enjoy the beaches, the parks, and just have some social interaction that they've been missing throughout that uh, first almost half of the year. Um, with that, we've seen a decline in activity, but we have not seen a decline in pricing. Uh, and, you know, headlines are often misleading when you see sales are down 15%. One would might take that as sales are not translating to price. So price is not down at all. Price has sustained. Uh, activity is definitely slower. We're not seeing as many multiple offers coming to the table as we were. Uh, we're seeing a lot more thoughtfulness behind the offers. Uh, we're seeing a little bit more time uh, between listing date to offer date, which is a great opportunity for people that have been uh, frustrated by the market and losing out on offers and perhaps put a hold on um, making an offer. This, you know, we're getting into that time frame now that uh, it's worth looking at the opportunities that are coming on. We're seeing some inventory increasing as, as well. So all kinds of exciting stuff that's out there. Rates have been low. So, you know, I think, I think we're in for a very positive uh, uh, approach to the summer. All right. Well, then let's uh, take out your magic eight ball and look further into the summer then. In terms of price and activity, are we going to stay pretty much the same then? I definitely don't expect a decline in pricing. Uh, I do expect that the uh, westerly movement from the GTA will continue, uh, which is what's driving our market. And I expect that there might be a little bit of flattening coming into the fall, uh, which will really only be the calm before the storm coming into next year, I expect that we'll probably see another eight to 10% increase in price. And traditionally, our region has always enjoyed a lot of activity from the end of March to the end of June, just because anyone who's looking to move, especially a family, will want to be settled in by September so that they can register their kids for school. This year, we hope to expect to have our kids in live school as opposed to online and that's a driving factor right now with people wanting to move in the next 60 to 90 days so is this a good thing uh, i mean from someone in your your line of work i know you've really been excited by the kind of prices you've been able to get for your clients and that sort of thing but this slight flattening is it is it a good thing overall i mean as you said more people are going to be able to to get into the market it's absolutely a good thing. Look, every 
every season has its value. And we're in a calmer season and we're approaching a calmer season. We're not getting as much activity. So if someone was really frustrated and, and rightfully so, because we've come out of a, a situation where, you know, you, you lose eight, nine, 10 times before you get the opportunity to buy a home and then you're paying, uh, you know, huge premiums to get in there. So this might be the time to put a little bit more thought into it, perhaps not feel that pressure of I'm competing against 10 people. Now, not to say that you're not going to be competing against anyone, but there's a higher chance of you being able to perhaps have a condition on financing, a condition on inspection, a condition on sale of your home, which is again, unlikely that someone's gonna accept that, but there is those opportunities are starting to exist again, which didn't before. So it, it is giving people a chance that thought, boy, we've missed the boat. There's no way we're going to enter the market. And remember, the interest rates have stayed low, which is giving people some encouragement in coming into the market. You mentioned that that we are seeing a slight increase in inventory. Where are we seeing that inventory come from? A lot of that inventory is coming from investors uh, who had purchased properties two, three, five years ago who expected 35 to 40% returns over 10 years because the region was appreciating three to 5% annually and then flattening and then three to 5% annually. While our neighbors in Toronto, Milton, Mississauga, Burlington, and Oakville were enjoying 10 to 12% increases every year. So the market all of a sudden caught up. And that's where, you know, you hear a lot about, oh, we're in a bubble and the market's going to crash. Well, we're not in a bubble. We've just caught up to where we should have been all along. Our market was discounted quite heavily in comparison to those east of us. So what we're looking at right now is people are saying, well, hang on, I bought a house two years ago. I'm up 38%. My 10-year plan doesn't need to be a 10-year plan again anymore. I can cash out now, take my equity or take my profits off the table. And especially if they're of the mindset that capital gains tax is going to increase and they're going to get less of their money and they're going to pay more tax on their money and there may be a wealth tax. So people are, you know, a little bit concerned about what the ramifications of those taxes will be. So it's saying, look, I'm up, I'm going to take money off the table, I'm going to put it away. Some of them are expecting that the market's going to have a downturn, or they'll reinvest this money in other markets that are not as hot as our region is. So this is where we're seeing um, people just taking some money off the table. So that inventory is hitting the market now, because that influx of investor owned property is starting to surface on the market. Just out of my own curiosity, if we take a look down the 401 at Toronto, what's going on down there? We talked before about the fact that there were all these office buildings sitting empty and people thought about turning them into condos. What's the what's the situation in Toronto at the moment? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Toronto and I was touring through uh, some condo buildings and just sort of getting an idea of what the valuations are. Uh, to my surprise, um, many of these buildings have been on, or units in these condo buildings have been on the market for many, many months. They had been on the market earlier in the year, taken off, relisted now. I'm seeing constant price reductions. I'm getting calls from agents saying, bring your clients back because we're expecting a further price reduction. Um, so I see a, a little bit of a depressed market in the condo market in Toronto. Um, I don't think that it's at the bottom yet. And I do feel that the condo market will decline in Toronto until immigration opens up again. And we're going to see that ramp right back up. So it's hard to say when the bottom is there on the condo market, but I already see a, approximately a 10% decline from what the peak was a year and a half ago in Toronto. Uh, office buildings, I don't know a whole lot about, but I do know that they are currently empty. Many of them are. Uh, the work at home environment has created this uh, you know, ability not to have to drive into work every day. What's going to be interesting about that is collaboration is not there. And people are missing that interaction and the energy of the work environment. Um, so I believe that a hybrid program 
will exist where, you know, work at home two or three days a week, work from the office three or four days a week, that type of thing, just to get people back into the mode, because I think we've all been, you know, working in our pajamas a little bit over the last year and a half. And, and there's a point where uh, you kind of miss that environment. And, and it's more of a productive environment, in my opinion, anyways, where you can be in the environment where there's energy and there's collaboration and there's discussion and, and you're sort of submersed into that as opposed to sitting at home on a Zoom call trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, we, we might even be able to do radio shows in person again someday. Welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. With us this hour from Remax Twin City Realty, it's Faisal Susie Walla, Canada's top real estate agent. If you'd like to get in touch, call 519-624-5555, or you can find out more right now as you listen to the radio show. Go online to homeshack.com. And now, uh, just just earlier this month, the, uh, the new rules for the stress test came into effect, if I'm not mistaken. So what are you seeing now, Faisal? How is that affecting the market? Surprisingly, and, and I'm glad to see that it's little to no effect on the market. Uh, it has restricted people's budgets by 4%. That means that if they were qualified for a $500,000 mortgage, that is now reduced to $480,000. Most people were not buying to the absolute peak of their affordability. Uh, or to what they were qualified. So there must have been somewhat of a margin left in their affordability that that 4% decline in their ability to borrow has not negatively impacted their, their opportunity to buy a home. And it certainly hasn't shown in pricing in the sale of a home. Because the rates are so low, it seems to be compensating for a lot of the other factors that may have been noted as being negative to the market. Uh, there's a lot of external influences that assist, especially young buyers today, in getting into home ownership. And, and you know, I know we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but there are alternative uh, resources available, be it through family funding or partnership funding and whatnot, to be able to come up with the down payment required. So the stress test, as much as it was meant to, um, you know, level things off and make things a little bit easier for people to enter the market, it's had little to no impact, in my opinion. Now, back in 2017, when the stress test was first introduced, um, it was at 4.79% from the, uh, from whatever the existing lending rate was, you still had to qualify at 4.79. That was a big jump from the existing rate to qualify at that rate. Today's qualifying rate is 5.25, which is not that much of a jump. So it has little to no impact. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Is that what you were expecting? A lot of people seem to be worried. It was not what I was expecting, just because we hadn't really uh, done the math on where things were going to be, uh, whether the interest rates were going to continue staying as low as they are. And what we hadn't taken into factor uh, was, or consideration was that uh, people were not pushing their limit from a qualifying perspective. So you may go into a bank right now and they might say, David, you know, you can afford to go up to $750,000 mortgage. And you're saying, well, that's great. Thank you very much, Mr. Banker. But I would really not like to extend myself to $750,000. I'll just go to $500,000. That still gave you enough room uh, that if the lending requirements were greater, or their interest rates were higher, you still have room to buy something less afford a, a less costly because you had the room in your qualifying. And since we mentioned the interest rates, let's talk about that. Uh, are they going to stay low? What are you seeing going on there? Well, there's the crystal ball question, right? Uh, I, I don't expect the rates to increase. We've seen them stay very stable. We've seen them stay low. Uh, there's no indication that the rates are going to increase. The rates are the driving factor 
I believe that, because uh, you know, you, even if you look at the variable rates or the five-year rates, the rates that are on variable are quite low right now. And if you look at a five-year rate, it's not that high. So the banks are not expecting uh, that, well, we better make these rates a little bit more uh, expensive for people to lock in. They're expecting them to stay around this. So I don't expect for the next at least three to five years for them to increase much, maybe 20, 25% increase in rates, but not, not a whole lot. So as you mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, a lot of the inventory we're seeing on the market now is from investors. So it, is that mean that investors are getting rid of their properties? Is it still a good time for investors to invest? So in tr the investors that are selling their properties who are those who have made huge ca capital gains in their properties in a very short period of time. Uh, so they're taking their money off the table for that reason. Um, what makes it still attractive to invest in this market is the fact that the rental market is in high demand and low supply. So the rental rates have increased significantly. I can give you an example that even up to two years ago, the average townhome in the region of Waterloo would have been around $1,750 to $1,800 per month. Today, we're touching $2,500 per month. So that's a huge increase. That's allowing the values to increase, but it also allows the investor to borrow more money because the rates are so low that the rent still makes sense and is still allowing them to put that down payment in and not that they're going to have a positive cash flow. And I talk a lot about this in my book that you're not necessarily buying cash flow. You want to be able to, cash flow is great if you can get it, but don't buy based on cash flow, buy based on appreciation. And that's where people have seen the greatest levels of gain is through appreciation. But the rental market is so hot right now that any investor entering the market buying a property today is not going to regret investing their money. So is that what you're seeing then is that most investors are looking for multi-unit uh, residential uh, properties? Not so much just multi-unit. Multi-unit is, is certainly an option, uh, but they're looking at more uh, townhomes, condominiums, uh, something single family. Uh, the challenge with multi-family or multi-unit buildings are that there may, there may be existing renters in there. And if there's an existing tenant in there, the increases on the rent are legislated based on Landlord Tenant Act, inflation, and there's been a freeze on increases. So a property can only have new rents set if the property is vacant. You cannot buy a property that has an existing tenant and decide to up the rent by 30%. So what, in your opinion, if a, an investor is just starting out then, what, what sort of a property would you tell them to go look for? When you're buying something, the first thing to look at is your exit strategy. You want to make sure that it's liquid or easily saleable. If you're going to buy a multifamily building, then you're depending on another investor to come in and buy that property. So you're pretty much limited to who your next buyer is going to be. When you buy a single family home, a condominium, a town home, a stacked town home, or anything that has single family type of uh, living, it will be attractive to a first time home buyer, to a downsizer, to another investor. So there's a lot of different people that would be interested in buying that property. It's also easier to finance a property like that because it's conventional financing. You put your 20% down and you're able to buy that property as opposed to going through a bunch of appraisals and reports and uh, studies before you can buy that and looking at cap rates and then the maintenance issues and then when you're a landlord in a multifamily type of environment, you're a little bit of a babysitter as well, because if someone's making a lot of noise upstairs uh, or they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing, uh, you're going to get that call in the middle of the night saying, you know, you need to make this thing stop or make it go away. Or there's a, a plumbing leak occurs in one of the units. It starts having an impact on all the other units as well. 
Welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us today on Ask the Experts. I'm Dave Callender. My guest is Faisal Suzy Walla of Remax Twin City Realty, Canada's top real estate agent and author of the book, The Real Deal, available uh, wherever great books are sold, like Amazon and Audible. We'll talk about that a little later on in the show. Uh, before the break, we, and we do want to mention that you can follow along at home by going to homeshack.com to learn more or just call Faisal at 519 624 5555. Before the break, we were talking about, uh, you know, investing, if it's still a good time to invest. And along that topic, um, what are you seeing, Faisal, with people? Are, is, it, is it, you know, single investors buying stuff? I've been hearing uh, in yeah. the news more about core development corporation. So what, what is that about? It's interesting. Um, I've for many, many years said that our region is prime for investment. Um, it has or had a lot of inventory available at one time to invest in and use that as a long-term plan to create wealth uh, to live off for retirement. And again, I talk a lot about my formula for investing, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But uh, yes, so I've heard about core developments that has come has identified Cambridge, Guelph, the region as a prime area to invest. So they've got, I, I believe it's a fund of about a billion dollars. And they've identified 10 cities where they've decided they're going to invest the money. Now, a lot of that is in Ontario, some of that is in Vancouver and some other provinces as well. But what they've done is they've, as an institution, have looked at the marketplace and said, where is their affordability? Where is their sustainability? Where is their good access? Where can we get the highest possible rent to make sense to that investment? So they're looking at a rate of return or a cap rate. And they've identified not commercial buildings, not office buildings, not plazas. They've identified single family homes, just as I mentioned earlier. So if you can scale that down as a family or as an individual and say that we're going to do the same thing, we're going to identify properties within our region that we can drive by every day. It's a tangible, it's not a mutual fund or a stock that can go to zero. And I'm gonna invest my money into this and let it grow because I see what I said earlier, appreciation, not cash flow. Cash flow is great, appreciation is better. And this is what companies like Core have, have identified, and Cambridge, Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo are prime markets for their investment dollars to come into. So these corporations don't just blindly identify these. They do a lot of research. They look at where the maximum growth is going to be. And that's where I come back and say, um, I'm not sure that my investors who are exiting their properties right now are making a great decision because the time to exit is not when there's that kind of demand in the market. When everybody's exiting, it's time to buy. And I, I really believe in that. Myself as an investor, I'm a long-term hold as opposed to in and out. And that's very important to sort of identify what your strategy is and what your goal is and what you're trying to achieve. Is it just quick in and out and to live off of that money? Or are you looking at retiring with some level of wealth and being able to live through your retirement and leave something for your family after you've moved on? Well, let's talk a little bit more about your formula for investing. I'm sure you get asked about it quite often. And another great reason to buy the book, folks. Uh, but let's give us a sneak peek. What is your formula for investing? Do you, do you buy and hold or do you flip? It sounds like you hold on to things. I do. And, and I call it in my book, I've identified it as 20 to 20. 20 to 20 is the formula. You put 20% down and you wait 20 years because you amortize it over that 20 year period, you pay it down with the rental income that you're receiving. And at the end of that 20 year period, you have a property that's paid off free and clear that has grown from your 20% investment because the rental income that was coming in was covering the financing. So what you were having is a depreciation in the amount of money that you owe the bank and an appreciation in the value of the property. So you're making it on both ends. And that's the beauty of investing in real estate. It's an appreciating asset. 
prices are just continuing to grow, land values are going up, material prices are going up, immigration continues coming in, demand keeps increasing. So, you know, you talk about an industry that for many years was overlooked from an investment perspective, because the easy thing to do was to give your money to a money manager. And I'm not against money managers. In fact, I believe in diversifying, but not putting all your money into that because we've seen what happens when the markets take a turn. So you want to have many options diversify so that if one market is a little bit weaker than the other, at least you're still balancing out at the end of the day. So 20 to 20, is my formula. Uh, I love talking about how it works and how you increase uh, your wealth doing it that way. And until you're at a certain age, what you can do is you continue leveraging the asset because at the five-year mark of the 20 years, you, if you're young enough and you've invested at, a, at an earlier age, and I have investors that started at 18 and 19 years old, and I have investors that just started investing at the age of 70. So it just depends on what your, your end result is going to be. But if you're early enough, you can keep leveraging, meaning you can keep borrowing against your asset every time the equity increases, every time the value increases. And if you look at it every five years, you may be able to extract up to 20% of the value of that property out to go buy a second property a third property, a fourth property. And let's just say now you're sitting at the age of 45. At that point, you can say, okay, I want to retire by 65. That's when you stop borrowing against your properties and let the mortgage get paid down and let the appreciation occur. And at the age of 65, you will retire with all your properties paid off in full with monthly income to take you right through your retirement. And this is another formula that we can use to invest for our children as well and identify certain properties for your children in, in the same way you would in an RESP to pay for their education, to help them get started in life so that they don't have the struggles that many young people have today buying their first home. Well, I was going to ask what what happens after the twenty years. Do you? It sounds like you you will continue to hold on to a property for retirement. Is that what most people do? Yes, absolutely. And what you want to do is create a portfolio that, at the age of sixty five, you have become accustomed to earning an X amount of dollars per year, and you're living a certain lifestyle. You live in a certain home, you drive a certain car, you take several vacations a year. You don't want your retirement years to be where you're saying, now that I'm retired, I don't have the kind of income that I used to have. So I'm going to now have to claw back. I'm going to have to sell my house. I'm going to have to sell a car. I can only take one vacation a year. I can't eat out anymore because I'm on a limited income. You want your income at retirement to actually be higher than what your income is while you're working. So, you know, you'll get up in the morning and your only job is to collect rent on the first of the month and you're living off of that rental income and you have assets that are paid off. The beauty of those assets are that you can leave those assets behind for your loved ones and give them a start in life as well or donate it or do whatever you want. But it's your money and it's paid off and it's your asset. It's money in the bank appreciating regularly. Let's talk a little bit more about what we can do for young people, since you mentioned it. Uh, a lot of young people are saying that they don't think they'll ever be able to own a home or they're struggling to get into the marketplace. Uh, what, are, what are some other things we can do to help them? So it starts with family. If you have children, as soon as they're of age, I think it's very important to get them into the mindset of home ownership. We want to raise our young people knowing that they should be buying homes. And I get it. The millennial environment is, hey, I don't want all those headaches. I, I can lease my car. I can lease my home. I can put my food on a credit card and I'll pay it off at the, every, every month. That's fine if that's what you choose to do. But there's no capital appreciation or wealth building in that formula. So if you have children, and I've done this with my kids. They have savings, whether it was their birthday money or whatever it was, and they have a little bit of a nest egg that they've saved up over the years. Well, when a property comes available, I know that my son or daughter wouldn't qualify for a mortgage or qualify to buy that home. 
make them your partner. If they've got, if you need $50,000 down and they've got $5,000, buy them in at 10%. And you buy the 90% of the equity in there. And over time, let them buy you out because it's going to force them to save money. It's going to force them to understand real estate, understand home ownership, and it's going to give them something to work towards. And I've done this with my kids. I've done this with my nephews where you, I like to call it multi-level partnering. So it doesn't have to be all mine. I can take a little piece of the action. You can take a little piece of the action and everybody wins in that formula. And you, because it's family, you give them the opportunity to increase their share over time. And this is one way that you're not just handing them a check at the end uh, and saying, here you go, I, 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 here's, here's X amount of dollars, go buy yourself a house. They've learned how to save. They've learned how to manage. They've learned how to collect rent. And they're renting these properties out and collecting rent. And they're getting the return based on their investment. And you're getting the balance of it. So this is a good way to get people started. And I do this with family. I also do this with partners. So I have a group of doctors. I have a group of professionals. I have a group of friends. I have a group of clients. And I will invest alongside with them. If I'm recommending something and one of my buyers says, well, Faisal, would you put your money into it? Because I don't have enough to put mine into it. Well, sure. If I feel it's good for you, it should be good enough for me. And if I'm in a position to do it financially, then I'm happy to do it. So you can, you can partner up. And by partnering up, you're now, and I know, I understand that a lot of people don't like partnerships. They don't, but have a partnership agreement, have shotgun clauses in there, speak to a lawyer, speak to an accountant, speak to the professionals, have everything drawn out so that you don't have conflicts later on in life. And that if God forbid, you're not around, your family won't have conflicts. But what you're doing is you're creating a pool in which to invest. And that will give young people a start later on in life because they've now got equity. Inflation will eat up your money. You can't leave money sitting in the bank waiting for it to depreciate while everything else is increasing at 8, 10, 12. We've just seen 36 to 38% increase in values. So those people who were sitting at home two years ago saying, well, you know what? I'm just going to wait for the market to slow down and then I'll buy, but I'll save up my money right now. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter how much money they tried to save up. It wasn't 38% of the value of the home that they were trying to buy. Mm -hmm. And uh, just before we go to break then, Faisal, just a little bit of advice. How do, you, how do you get your teenagers to be interested in real estate? Because I remember when I was a teenager, I would have probably went, eh, that's dull. But do, do your kids take after their dad? Are they interested? Well, unfortunately, they have to live with me and I eat, sleep, breathe real estate. So they have no choice. I've ruined them. Um, but I think it's very important to educate our children financial literacy is so important we've talked about this before david and i talk about this in my book like you have to start teaching your kids at a very early age i've been saying for years that schools have to have courses that's great you know functions and calculus and biology are all great topics to learn in school but let's learn about mortgages and investing and rates of return and interest and compound interest and what to do with your money because that's a fact of life and it's unbelievable not only kids how many adults still don't have the basic concept of how all of that works and it's so important to learn so it starts at home it you have to make a conscious decision to sit down with your children and say look because I see what's going on in the marketplace today and I get all the trolls on my Facebook yelling at me because the prices are going up too high and that their, their kids will never be able to buy a home and I feel bad for that but I also don't feel bad because those individuals should have been teaching their kids how to invest and holding their hands. If they owned a home, they should have helped their kids understand how home ownership works. Welcome back to the show. Very glad you joined us today. My guest is Faisal Suzuwala of Remax Twin City Realty, online at homeshack.com, or uh, you can give them a call at 519-624-5555. And uh, I've been mentioning it throughout the show, but now let's actually talk about the book. Uh, give us the official title once again, Faisal. So the book is called The Real Deal, Journey of a Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker. 
and I uh, wrote it uh, throughout the COVID period uh, over the last year, and I published it last year in uh, September. And uh, for folks who want to get a copy, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's also available as an audiobook from Audible, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, so whether you want to read it or listen to it, it's, it's, it's widely available. And it tells a lot of stories, a lot of stories about your life in particular. And I guess the first question is the first question. What got you into the business? Well, I stumbled into this business almost by mistake, believe it or not. I was a 17-year-old kid watching late night television. Uh, and, and most of the listeners here are probably too young to remember Tom Vu. He was a gentleman on uh, television on the back of a yacht uh, investing in real estate. And I'm like, I want to be that guy. He's got a nice big yacht. He's got beautiful ladies surrounding him. And he has sports cars and all of that. And I want to be that guy. So I uh, learned a little bit about uh, uh, his course. And it was very expensive. That summer, I was at uh, Galt Collegiate. And at that summer, I had uh, the opportunity to take a little course at Conestoga College, uh, which was a licensing course, which I didn't even know. I thought I'd just learn a little bit about real estate and maybe one day, if I had enough money, I could invest in real estate. Well, at the end of that course, all of my colleagues were getting their real estate license. I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe I should do that too. But I was still 17, so I had to wait until I was 18. I then got my real estate license. Then I went back to school, and a young friend of mine uh, said, you should go talk to my dad. He owns a local brokerage. Um, so I didn't have a car. I walked down to uh, the local uh, main street there. And I asked the broker if he would hire me. And he said, well, you look like you're 12 and you need to uh, get some education behind you. So no, I will not hire you and um, come back in a few years when you look older and you are serious about this. So I was waiting for the bus and I remembered uh, an old friend of my dad's, Mr. Maneri, Reed Maneri. Uh, lived across from the bus terminal, or sorry, had an office across from the bus terminal. So I went up, I asked him if he would consider hiring me, and he did. And that was the beginning of my career at the age of 18, while I was still in high school. Wow, that's, uh, you know, that takes a lot of gumption to just go for something like that. And uh, I think, of course, that that is part of what made such a difference for you. What were some of the other turning points in your life, though? What I mean is what, what got you into investing and not just selling homes? A lot of real estate agents, they, they just sell homes. I wasn't satisfied just being a salesperson. I wanted more. Um, I wanted more for my family. Uh, my parents worked very hard to raise us. My dad had an industrial accident. My mother worked in a factory to raise us. And I just wanted more. And I thought, what, this license that I have gives me the ability to do more than just sales and real estate. So I started investing money at a very young age. And I did exactly what I was mentioning earlier. When somebody would buy something, be it land, be it a rental property, I would just throw my commission back in. So whether it was 2%, 3%, 5%, whatever it was, and I would just take a little bit of partnership in that. What I learned from that is that money started growing and I was able to keep turning that back in. I realized that that's a very good way to have passive income or passive wealth being built without having to manage that on a day-to-day -day business. So I could manage my business. I could sell properties. I was monetizing my real estate license by using that license to go and do other things that were related. And I was learning at the same time and I was partnering with the right people. I was learning from them. Sometimes you learn from your own experiences and other times you learn from the experiences of others. And I was very fortunate that I was a sponge. I was 18 years old, 19 years old. I went through some hard times as a 19 year old. I went bankrupt because 1990 came along and recession hit values hit went down 30%. I was invested with foreign investors, but I was the Canadian on, on, uh, on the mortgage. So it was a very good lesson to learn at a very young age, um, how the markets can affect you, how risk can adversely affect you and not to put more money in than you're willing to lose. And finally, I just, I know this might seem like an obvious question, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective. 
To you, what is the purpose of building wealth? The purpose of building wealth, number one, is to have a comfortable life for yourself. Num and, and, and I'm going to say this personally speaking. Number two is to create an environment for your children uh, and for your family where they don't have that fear of the sheriff showing up at the door and locking you out or you not being able to make the next mortgage payment um, or having to live with that fear that tomorrow everything can be taken away from you. When you build wealth, you have things to fall back on. And that's where I believe in diversity to have many different investments, many different types of investments, even in the same portfolio. So you could have commercial, you could have residential, you could have industrial, you could have land holdings, you could have single family homes, and then you could have mutual funds and stocks and bonds and cash and gold, whatever it may be, but just to diversify your investments so that you have checks and balances and areas that are not always there. So comfort is one, fear is the other, and I'm speaking personally. Um, and, and the last is to be able to do stuff for your community, to be able to give back to your community, a community that supports you, that enables you to earn what you do, enables you to build your wealth. Um, it's only right that you continuously give back. And that's something that's very near and dear to my heart. All right, folks, it's all great reasons to buy a copy of the book. Uh, and after you're, you've done reading the book, uh, Faisal, quickly tell us what, what sort of tools are we going to have in our hands after we've finished? Uh, the, the book was written almost in a way that follows my life. So I needed inspiration when I was a young kid. Um, and the purpose of the book was for me to inspire young people who may feel that they're lost. Look, I had a lot of things going against me, but uh, I persevered. I was... Uh, going to make this work. And I write about that. Um, the other is just showing industry people, people that work in our industry, the tools. Um, I get asked all the time, hey, can you share your secrets? It's all there in the book. If you want to know what makes me tick, what's helped me become successful, it's all there. Um, then I also talk about investment strategies because I have a lot of friends and clients and people that I want to share my ideas because they ask me again, how did you go about it? And I want to share that. So these are all things that I've uh, put into the book uh, to just help people understand what I did to get to where I am. It's available on Amazon, also for your Kindle and for Audible. Faisal, thanks so much for once again being with us. My pleasure. Always great talking to you, David. Folks, thank you for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with Faisal Suzuwala of Remax Twin City Realty, go online to homeshack.com to learn more or give him a call at 519-624-5555. Thanks for listening. Join us again next Saturday for more of Ask the Experts here on 570 News.